All across America and around the world, this is Veterans Radio. This is Veterans Radio. And now, your host for today's program, Dale Throneberry. And welcome to Veterans Radio. My name is Dale Throneberry, and I'm so happy to have you here on our program. We're going to be talking about veterans. We're going to be talking about helicopters. So as I mentioned, my name is Dale Throneberry. I was a CW2 helicopter pilot in Vietnam in 1969. As I said, we want to welcome you to our program. Uh, We're going to be talking about a new PBS special that is going to be coming up on Tuesday. Uh, It's called The American Veteran. It's a four-part program, and I'm going to have one of the producers on in just a second. So I'm I'm excited to talk to them about that particular program. And then I've got another uh, helicopter pilot coming on a little bit. His name is Larry Freeland, and he's written a book entitled Chariots in the Sky, a story about U.S. assault helicopter pilots at war in Vietnam. And uh, Larry was a Chinook pilot. Actually, with the 159th in Vietnam, he was a pachyderm, so I'm interested to uh, talk with him. But first, I want to make sure that we thank our sponsors. Um, you know, we can't do this program without them and without you, our listeners out there. So number one is going to be Legal Help for Veterans. Legal Help for Veterans is a veteran's disability uh, law firm that helps veterans uh, with their disability claims. For more information, you can go to their website. That is LegalHelpForVeterans.com. The National Veterans Business, whoa, I messed that one up a lot. NVBDC uh, is a a third-party organization that recognizes veteran-owned businesses, certifies veterans-owned businesses. And so we would encourage you to go to talk with them if you are uh, operating a veteran-owned business in order to do business with the government and with some corporations you need to get certified. So go to nvbdc.org. Eisenhower Center. The Eisenhower Center here in Ann Arbor, Michigan is a um, in-house uh, treatment center for athletes, veterans, anybody who has suffered from a traumatic brain injury, PTSD, anything along those lines. And for more information, you can go to their website. That is EisenhowerCenter.com. And then finally is the Charles S. Kettles Veterans uh, uh, Health Center here in Ann Arbor, Michigan. Uh, It's the hospital system that we have going here in uh, Ann Arbor. And the other thing I want to remind everybody is that next week is our benefits program. So if you have any questions about either health care through the VA or through the disability benefits program, uh, start sending me emails so we can get those uh, with our experts. That will be here because we'll be doing that program live. All right. I think that takes care of most of the business. Uh, Joining me on the uh, line right now is a producer of the American Veteran, and her name is uh, Leah Williams. Leah, welcome to Veterans Radio. Thank you so much for having me. It's a pleasure. Thank you. Thank you very much. Oh, you've been busy. It says you're an independent director and producer. Uh, Your work has been recognized with Emmys, uh, DuPont, Peabody's, NAACP Image Awards. How did you get involved in the American Veteran? Um, you know, it, it was uh, because I'm an independent um, uh, producer and director. Um, really, I was uh, approached by uh, the production company Insignia Films. This is um, something that they had been developing um, for a while. And they said, you know, we were looking for um, another director to come on, um, Steve Ives, who um, is the founder of Insignia Films. Um, he was looking for uh, a directing um, partner, and um, we just connected. And, you know, my uh, father was in um, uh, the Navy Reserve, and I just I just, I felt like I couldn't pass up this incredible opportunity to really get to talk to so many veterans. So it was, it was a no-brainer for me. Well, the, the program is, is, is more of a brainer. I was very impressed, at least with the previews that I've seen. Can you tell us a little bit about The American Veteran? Sure. It's a... Um, it's part of a multimedia uh, a project. Um, there's sort of a three parts. Um, there's the four-hour documentary, American Veteran. Um, there is a nine-episode uh, podcast, and there's actually a 10-part uh, digital short series. Um, I directed uh, two of the episodes for American Veteran, the documentary series, uh, and produced all the episodes. And really, the way that the program is structured um, is that it takes you through the sort of career arc, if you will, um, of a veteran. 
So the first hour deals with enlistment um, um, and training, um, or or for those who were drafted. Uh, the second hour deals with tour of duty. Um, the third hour deals with uh, leaving the military, whether that's coming home um, from war or retirement. Um, and then the fourth hour is sort of reckoning with it all, um, and you know, asking lots of uh, lots of questions. So yeah, that's that's really the structure of the program, and I just thought it was just a really a great way to. Um, not only um, showcase essentially what it's like to be a veteran, but in order, but it also to try and kind of close some of that gap a bit between civilians and veterans um, to just give a better sense and have civilians have a better understanding, really, um, of what it's like to be a veteran. Well, that's true. Uh, I, I think the idea of, of the um, entertainment personalities that you've got acting as hosts, can you tell us about them? Sure. Um, so, yeah, we thought it would be um, a really a great idea to essentially have uh, the narrators for each hour um, be better in themselves. Everyone who's involved, um, uh, who speaks on a camera or you hear their story is a veteran. Um, and so we wanted our uh, narrators to be veterans as well. And so the idea is that we use their personal story to sort of help us kind of uh, be the spine, if you will, through each hour. So the first hour, we're talking about training. Uh, Drew Carey, uh, comedian, television host, um, he was in the Marine uh, Reserve. And so um, we sort of, you know, learn how he joins um, and sort of his uh, a bit about his training as we hear, you know, from all the other veterans who show up in, 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 in the program. Uh, the second hour, um, our host is uh, Senator Tammy Duckworth. Um, and, you know, and her incredible um, um, story and her incredible sacrifice. And, and she takes us through what, you know, what things were like for her. Um, that third hour with coming home, we um, are we go on a journey with actor Wes Duty, a Native American actor and, and activist. And um, um, he he's lived an incredible uh, life. And, and it was really just important for us to, to make sure that we had someone who, you know, had been uh, sort of asking some of those questions upon leaving the service. Um, he had served in Vietnam. And so the idea that, you know, when he got back and trying to make sense of things, we wanted that to be front and center. Um, and then the fourth hour is uh, hosted by um, actor and motivational speaker J.R. Martin. Um, um, you may have uh, recognized him from um, winning uh, one of the cycles of Dancing with the Stars, but he has an incredible story um, in that he was um, um, badly burned and injured uh, while he was um, in Iraq. And so essentially his um, sort of the process of recovery and, 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 and rebuilding. So, yeah, we, we were incredibly fortunate to have uh, uh, these veterans uh, join our program. Well, as I mentioned, we're, we are talking right now with uh, Leo Williams, who's one of the producers of The American Veteran. And it's a four-part series that's going to be on PBS starting this Tuesday, correct? Yes, correct. And uh, I encourage everybody to watch this program. I, it, it, as I mentioned, the previews were really, um, I don't know what the term is. They were kind of addictive as I started watching them. I uh, wanted to know more and more, and I can't wait to to watch this program. So it's the American Veteran. It's on PBS. It starts on Tuesday, the 26th of October at 9 o'clock um, Eastern Time, at least for the local listeners out here. I, I suggest that you check with your local PBS station and see when they're on. It's four programs, and some of them are really uh, kind of intense, I thought. Would, would you agree? Yeah, I mean, I would say there's definitely an intensity there. Um, you know, uh, we try to get in some, some lighthearted moments as well. But, I mean, I think, you know, what we really wanted to do was to just to, to highlight what's really real. Um, I, I think it's an intense time. Um, and I don't think you have to have gone to war to, to feel the intensity of, of having served and, you know, what it, uh, what it means to, you know, to do your job, to have people rely on you, to have those bonds, um, you know, to potentially um, be facing going into a war zone, um, you know, to deal with the, the stresses and the traumas. Um, so, yeah, I, I would say intense um, is is the right word. But I think it was important for uh, for for veterans to see that so they under, so that they don't feel so alone in that process, right? Um, and also for civilians to see that so they have a better understanding of of what veterans go through. I thought that that's that's a very good point, Leah, and I, I want to thank you for, for saying that. Um, I've just got one line I wanted to take from some of your, your publicity that was out there. This was Teddy Roosevelt, and he's talking about the basic training. I think that's episode one. 
He's argued that the tent where soldiers all sleep will rank among the great agents of democratization. In the chaos of boot camp, it can take time for that kind of thinking to sink in. But recruits soon learn that finding community and understanding with fellow recruits is the only way to survive the rigors of basic training. And relying on fellow recruits can be the key to success. And that's one of the lessons that we all learned. Some of us took a lot longer to learn it. Um, but it is certainly the important thing. It was the important thing that, that we had to know. Um, right. And, wait, right. I mean, relying on each other. Right. Relying on each other. I mean, I think um, that's one of really the key things that I took away uh, from this was really the intensity of bonds that um, are formed um, among those who serve. You know, one of our uh, veterans, Jake Wood, he was a Marine sniper who served in Iraq and Afghanistan. And he said, you know, you may not like a lot of people you serve with, but you love all of them. He said, I might not want to get a beer with everyone, but if they called him in the middle of the night, um, said they were in a dark alley and they needed someone, he'd be there in a heartbeat. And I thought that that was really just a beautiful way to sort of talk about, you know, the intensity of, uh, of the bonds, um, and the camaraderie that's formed, um, you know, through the process. Again, whether, you know, whether you served in a, in, uh, you know, in a combat zone, um, or not, I do think there is, uh, something special, um, about, um, about that time. Right. Absolutely. Absolutely. So I encourage everybody to do this. Leah, is there anything else that you would like to add? Um, I would just, yeah, just encourage people to, uh, to watch. It runs over the course of um, uh, four weeks. So it's every Tuesday. Um, so it's October 26th, November 2nd, November 9th, and November 16th. And I would say from my perspective, you know, the one ethos that I feel like really um, is clear in the military is uh, that we're all in this together. And my hope really is that, um, you know, people come away from this, civilians come away from this, and that uh, understanding is underscored, that we really are all in this together, civilians, veterans, um, and we have a responsibility to one another. So I hope that I hope that comes across. Well, I, I think it will. Well, thank you so very much for your work on this project. And I encourage everyone to watch The American Veteran. It's on PBS starting this coming Tuesday at 9 o'clock Eastern time. And I uh, can't wait to... Maybe we can talk to you later on as we go through some of the episodes. Sure. I'd be, I'd be happy to. <laughs> okay. Thank you very much for being on Veterans Radio. Thank you. Thank you, Leah. All right. We're going to go into our next uh, little uh, interview here, but I've got a little segment that I want to play. And I'm sure that many of you are familiar. We have used this segment many times on Veterans Radio when we're talking about helicopters. And I think it's kind of a nice way of, of introducing our next guest. Joe Galloway, many of you recognize the name possibly. He's a military writer. He was involved. Uh, he was a journalist in, in Vietnam. He's the only civilian ever to receive a bronze star for, you know, for, for bravery. Uh, he was in the Battle of the Idrang Valley and he was in a film, uh, quite a while ago now, it seems, um, uh, called In the Shadow of the Blade. And in the, his little, uh, dialogue or monologue, uh, that he gives is called, uh, where he refers to helicopter pilots as God's own lunatics. So I'm going to play that little segment. It runs about two minutes. And when we come back, I'm going to give you the opportunity to meet our next guest, and that's going to be Larry Friedman, Chinook pilot uh, in Vietnam. So hold on. Here we go. We'll see if this works. I hope it does. I don't know if there's anybody here today who doesn't thrill to the sound of those blades. That familiar wop, wop, wop is the soundtrack of our war, the lullaby of our younger days. To someone who spent his time in Nam with the grunts, I've got to tell you that noise was always a grumford. It meant someone was coming. Someone was coming to get our wounded. Someone was coming to bring us water and ammo. Someone was coming to take our dead brothers home. And eventually, someone was coming to give us a ride out of hell. Even today, when I hear it, I saw it catch my breath and think back to those days. I love you guys as only an infantryman can. No matter how bad things were, if we called, you came. Down the green tracers and other visible signs of a real bad day, off to a real bad start. To us, you seem beyond brave and fearless that you come to us in the battle 
in those flimsy, thin-skinned crates. And in the storm of fire, you would sit up there behind that thin plexiglass, seeming so patient and so calm and so vulnerable, waiting for the offloading and the onloading. We thought you were God's own lunatics, and we loved you. Still do. We're the fortunate ones. We survived when so many better men gave up their precious lives for us. We owe them a sacred debt to live each day to its fullest. What they're saying when you listen hard enough is this. We're at peace, and so should you be. And so should you be. That was Joe Galloway from uh, the documentary In the Shadow of the Blade. Uh, Joe, unfortunately, passed away a couple of months ago, and we're all... He was a, a true friend of the American veteran. Um, I play that because I'm, uh, I'm going to introduce our next guest to, to you, who is, also happens to be a rotorhead like myself, and I'm really excited to talk with him. His name is Larry Freeland. Uh, Larry has written a book entitled Chariots in the Sky, a story about uh, U.S. assault helicopter pilots in the war in Vietnam. He was a, uh, a pilot himself. He was a Chinook pilot in Vietnam, and then he decided he'd take up riding. Uh, so, Larry Freeman, welcome to Veterans Radio. Well, thank you, Dale. I'm glad to be here. I appreciate you uh, giving me the opportunity to be here. Well, I, I, I was, I'd heard about your story, and I wanted to make sure that uh, we got to tell them. I liked I, I told my audience last week, you know, I, I love to tell helicopter stories. I think anybody who's ever flown a helicopter or even been on a ride in a helicopter uh, can understand the attraction that they hold. It's a, it's a magic carpet. And, you know, <laughs> what other what other form of transportation can you go up, down, sideways, stop in midair, go backwards, and everything else that you want to do? I mean, it, it's, it's a great story. So t- tell me, give me a little bit of, of your background as far as uh, your helicopter experience. Um, sure. Uh, start with um, basically when I went into service. Um, I graduated from college in 1968 in June. Of course, we can all relate to that period of time. There was a draft, and you either went into the service or you were drafted. Uh, I had been accepted uh, to the Air Force flight training program. I wanted to be a pilot. and uh, But the earliest they could get me in because of the backlog was October of 68. Well, my draft board didn't give me a deferment, wouldn't work with me, so I was drafted into the Army in July of 1968. Uh, through my training, I was continually, as other guys with college degrees, offered an opportunity to go to OCS officer school. And I took that towards the end of my advanced infantry training in Fort Dix, New Jersey, along with a bunch of other fellows. Ended up in infantry school down at Bending for six months, came out as a second lieutenant in July of 69, and was stationed there for six months before I was to be shipped to NAM as a platoon leader. And while I was there, I had an opportunity to work with uh, – rangers and paratroopers and pi- helicopter pilots. And make a long story short, the pilots convinced me that if I was going to Vietnam, it would be a little better to be a pilot than to be an infantry guy on the ground. You know, you get a few beers at night, get a hot cop maybe, and it's a shower once a week or something like that. So I volunteered, I was accepted, and then ended up going to uh, flight training in 19, uh, six, uh, 1970 at Fort uh, Walters, Texas first, what they call prime, well, you did their primary school, four and a half months, and then, uh, uh, to Fort Rucker in Alabama for another about five months where we learned, uh, instruments and formation flying and tactics and convert and transition into the Huey. I was fortunate. I, uh, finished pretty high in my class and was given an opportunity to transition into CH 47 Chinooks. And I thought, well, gee, I think I'll do that because they're a little bigger. Uh, they got twin engines, twin rotors, and some redundant systems. And I thought, you know, they probably don't see quite as much ground action as the Hueys and the Cobras will see. So I went through that and uh, graduated and then went home on leave and then ended up going to Vietnam in January of 1971. Um, arrived there in country on uh, January the 3rd down in uh, Saigon, Tonsonut area. Uh, we didn't know it at the time, but all the pilots that were coming into that area, uh, Huey pilots, Chinook pilots, they were being sent up north. Uh, 
There was a big operation in the works. Of course, again, we didn't know that at the time, but virtually all the pilots that came in down in that part of the country were shipped up to the 101st. And I was one of them. And we ended up there probably about January the 6th. And in the 101st, everybody coming into country would be sent to what they called CERTs, Screaming Eagles Replacement Training School. And we spent about six days getting accustomed to the weather, the terrain, start shoot some weapons again, try and get us a little bit more acclimated before we went to our units to begin our tour. While we were there, we we went out on some patrols right outside the wire, nothing, not looking for trouble. They were just, we were too new for that. So in about a week, I was shipped back down to Fubai where the main 101st aviation assets were. They were mostly in the Fubai airport and a little bit in Camp Eagle, which was near there, just south of Way. I was assigned to A Company, 159th Aviation Battalion, Chinook Company. There were three companies, A, B, C, and for the life of me, I can never remember the call signs of the other two companies. But with the pachyderms, when I was moved in there, spent the first couple of weeks getting acclimated to the, reacquainted, if you will, with the Chinook, because I've been, I hadn't been flying one for over a month. And the more experienced pilots took me out and showed me the AO and gave me opportunities to fly up and down the valley there, the Ashaw Valley, and fly up and down the mountains, resupplying the fire bases on the top of the Ashaw Valley mountains there. And then some weather flying, so on and so forth. And then somewhere in there, we had initiation. I think most helicopter pilot companies had some form of initiation into the company brotherhood. I won't go into our initiation, but as a result of that, you would, I've shown you earlier, you'd pick an icon that was our elephant pachyderms, and they were big wooden pachyderms. And you would pick one out before you started your initiation, and they'd tape your name on it, and then you'd be initiated. Take you two days to recover from that, and then we started flying. If you finished your tour after a year, you were able to take that wooden pachyderm home, and they would take the tape off and put a plaque on it, and then you could send it home. It was January, the end of January, the first day of February. I'd only been in the company a couple weeks. We were called into an operational meeting, all the pilots, and at that time, we had about 28 Chinook pilots in our company, 16 aircraft. We were low on pilots, as the other companies were at that time. And we were told that there was going to be this massive incursion into Laos. They had reactivated Quezon up there in the northwest corner of South Vietnam on the DMZ, and we would be, the 101st, all of its aviation assets, would be providing the air support, helicopter support, for the Vietnamese military. They were going to send in about 22,000 Army soldiers, South Vietnamese Army, Arvin troops, and some Marines, and they were going to penetrate as deep as they could, about 60 miles into Laos, along a little road called Route 9. And as they went down that road, their infantry and their armor, they would plop in Marines and Rangers along the way on the higher peaks on the ridgelines that were on both sides of this road. And they would provide some security for the troops going down, making the actual attacks and moving deeper into Laos. And this operation was to be the first real big test of Vietnamization. President Nixon wanted to turn the war over as fast as he could to the south, and he'd been working on that the previous year, and it was picking up steam going into 1971. So in this scenario, it was to be about a four-month operation, going a little more, 60 miles in, into what was supposedly a big base camp out there. And they were going to take that over, and on the way, take on any NVA they ran into, and capture any supplies and weapons and so on that they could find as they did their movement deeper into the country. On paper, it sounded like a pretty good idea, but the whole operation was put together, we learned this later, pretty rapidly, and probably not real well thought out. They clearly didn't put enough troops into it, and didn't factor into what the helicopter pilots, and I'm going to get to that in a minute, were going to face as they started trying to support the South Vietnamese forces in Laos. The year before, 
President Nixon allowed the Americans to go into Cambodia. You may recall that in 69. And they went in pretty deep looking for the NVA and the supply caches and the base camps. And that was very successful. They, they uh, captured a lot they, they, uh, of supplies. Uh, they destroyed a lot of base camps and took on a pretty big swath of some NVA. And they made a big dent in their uh, in camps in there. And it set them back almost a year. But when Congress found out and the, and the media started reporting it, uh, Nixon had to back off and he pulled them out. So, but using that as a, as a game plan, if you will, they decided to do the same thing up in Laos, but they weren't going to use Americans because uh, Nixon had no more authority to send Americans <laughs> legally outside of South Vietnam. So, but the, the uh, Arvin and the Marines for South Vietnam could not uh, supply themselves. They could not do it without helicopter support and they just didn't have it. We were starting to train some pilots, South Vietnamese pilots, to, you know, fly here at Hueys and, and Chinooks, but they just didn't have the force. So it fell on the Americans. Uh, the 101st had about 680 helicopters, uh, mostly Hueys, three companies of Chinooks, um, and loaches and cobras. And the total force was dedicated to this operation. Uh, we augmented that as we got into it a little bit because we, we, uh, took tremendous losses going into about the third week of this operation. So uh, the first week uh, went pretty smooth. We put in fire bases on both sides of the road, about 10 miles in, fire base, what they call fire base 30, fire base 31, and a couple of others. And the mechanized uh, Arvin troops moved down Route 9 and made some pretty good progress. And they started to bog down a little bit as they got out to the uh, – into the Laos and approaching the furthest fire bases we'd set up, it was time to insert a lot more fire bases out further. That's when it got dicey, the second week going into the third week. The further we went out and in deeper into Laos, setting these fire bases on both sides of Route 9 and the higher elevations, the ridge lines and the mountains, uh, the intensity of the NVA uh, uh, activity just increased. They literally, and we didn't know that then, there's been an excellent book written since then that there was a high-level spy in the MACV headquarters, an NVA spy who was a South Vietnamese, and he was passing on all the information to the North, Hanoi. They knew more than we knew, and they were waiting on us. Um, So by the second week, they were already anticipating where these fire bases were going to be, and, and as the Hueys assault companies were bringing in the South Vietnamese troops to establish the initial LZ. Uh, they were coming under heavy fire. So, it, and that was the second week and it, and it never let up for the next uh, seven weeks. Uh, and the, uh, let's Excuse see. me for interrupting. The, the, yeah. the, the, uh, the name of this, this uh, mission was what? It was called Lam San 719 and the Americans called it Dewey Canyon 2. Okay, because I think there are many of our, I, I know I was talking to some other veteran friends of mine about what was coming up this weekend on the program, and they said, oh, I was part of that. And yeah. uh, and, and if, if you could, you know, I, I do want to get to your book, <laughs> but, yeah. I, but all of this, I think all of this kind of leads up to it. Yeah. If you could t- tell our audience a little bit about the type of weaponry that the North Vietnamese were using at that time, and we were supposed to go over there and and block off the Ho Chi Minh Trail, you know, to eliminate their supplies. And, of course, that didn't work too well. No, short short version, um, by the second week going into the third week, there was about 22,000 South Vietnamese troops moving their way into Laos. The North had brought down almost 65,000 troops, and they literally would swamp these guys' uh, fire bases when we were trying to put them in. Uh, and then uh, as we did get them established, they would commit more troops the kind of firepower we would meet, these were the Huey pilots. They were down on the deck, as, as you were one. Uh, and they had to do basically nap of the earth to get in there and put these troops in and then go in and out where they could to supply them with what they could with a Huey. Uh, of course, they were covered by uh, Cobra gunships, and then loaches would be looking for uh, for different uh, places to try and s- avoid some fire and and look for the NVA and say they're over here and call in the Air Force and help the fax call in the Air Force. But the helicopter pilots, the uh, Huey pilots, the Cobra pilots, the Loach pilots, and I'll come to the Chinooks, which I flew in a minute, but 
when you were going in like that, we were being shot at by 51 caliber machine guns. We were being shot at by RPGs, AK-47s. Uh, when they get close to the LZ, they'd be dropping mortar rounds in, They even artillery. And into the second month, uh, about the fifth or sixth week, as the fire bases that we'd set up earlier and then and the later ones were coming under heavy assault, uh, they were rolling in tanks. We we came under tank fire. Now, it's not – it's pretty easy uh, – don't speak from a lot of experience, but uh, it's pretty easy to miss a tank shell, but it's not easy to miss the caliber of the machine guns they've got on top of them because those tanks can get in a lot closer. They're literally in the wire, and they could be deadly with their fire from those uh, machine guns they had on the turrets. So it was more the machine gun fire from the tanks than the tank fire themselves that was that could be devastating. I'm not saying the tanks couldn't be, but uh, we faced those too. So we literally encountered, in 20 millimeter, I think I mentioned that, in 40 millimeter cannons that they used in World War II, um, we, we encountered more firepower and more types of firepower in 60 days than had ever been encountered in the whole Vietnam War. Uh, and it was an intense 60-day slugfest. I'll give you some figures in a minute that will put it in more perspective. But the, um, most pilots uh, felt like, and it was the general consensus, that once you cross the border from South Vietnam into Laos, you had a 50-50 chance of coming back. It was that intense. Uh, I can give you the numbers here, just put that in perspective a little bit. Let's see here. Uh, the 101st Division had about 680 helicopters. Of those, 84 were shot down in Laos and never recovered. Another 430 were battle damaged. 20% of those were so badly shot up, we couldn't use them. We used them for scrap. Oh. And then uh, the total helicopters devoted to that were a little over 750. We had to bring in about another 100 choppers uh, as we were losing so many. So we got up to about a total of 750, a little over that. The numbers are a little, you know, Vietnam, the numbers are a little hard to peg sometimes. <laughs> but uh, about 750 and the total out of that 680, 600, I'm sorry, 618 were battle damaged out of 780, 618. And out of that, 108 were shot down and lost. So almost 90% of the helicopter force was either shot down, not recovered, and or battle damaged. And many of those we couldn't use. They were so shot up. Okay. We, lost, okay. we lost 78 crew members. They were killed. How many? I'm sorry, I interrupt you. Uh, 78. 78 crew members were killed during 60 days. Uh, 54 were wounded and another 11 were MIA. So it was just, it was an intense operation. Um, biggest I, of the I, war. I, quite intense. Um, I know I've talked to people. Our, my company went to the 195th, so it's down in three corps. And our company was disbanded at the end of 1970. Mm-hmm. And the pilots that were there at the time, um, I was long gone, but the ones that were still there, they they were dispersed around. And the the Army had this weird thing. I can't remember. I don't know what the rules were, but if you had X amount of time in country, you could go home. If you had less than that time, you got sent to another company to finish out your tour. Right. You know, we picked up a lot of those fellows well into 1971. They started coming in to our unit about June and July as the other units were standing down. We got up to about 45 pilots by the end of the summer, and we'd operated during Lamson with maybe about 25 to 28. Okay. So we could have used a few more help. I'm, I'm, I'm starting to feel guilty here because I was an instructor pilot for Hueys all of 19, 1970 and up till May of 1971. I have I have a feeling that some of my boys had to show up in the 101st. Probably did. I am, did. Uh, I'm afraid to go back and look at my my roster of students just to see what had happened. It, it, it sounds like it was, I mean, helicopter pilots, um, you know, many of us, you know, we'd, we'd, we'd fly into these, you know, intense areas where you'd get shot out on a fairly regular basis. And then there were other pilots that would fly a lot, you know, what we consider, you know, the, the safer missions, the, the resupplying and, and so forth, what we called ash and trash at the time. Right. But, the, you know, the, when it was intense, it was incredibly intense. And the um, this is where I want to do the transition to the book now. 
Okay. Right. So we are talking with, with Larry Freeland here and his book is called Chariots in the Sky. It's a, it's a, it sounds like a semi biographical fictional version of what he experienced, uh, those 60 days. How's that sound? Uh, that's pretty good. <laughs> uh, the book covers basically a year, but the first half is, is dedicated to that operation, sets the stage and everything. And then the other uh, part of it goes into specific, you know, various uh, occurrences to kind of round out the experience of a helicopter pilot. My goal was to kind of touch on as many aspects of what a pilot faced uh, while he was there to give the reader a better feel for, you know, what we did and how we felt and what it was like. Uh, I, you know, I, I wrote this book as a historical fiction uh, based on uh, actual events and units and so on, I used uh, uh, fictional characters who, in some cases, uh, were, were composite characters. Uh, and then I built the storyline around uh, actual events. In some cases, I would put a little more drama into it, although it's I don't know how much drama you need when you get shot at. <laughs> but, but I wanted to up the action a little bit more in some cases, if you will. Uh, in the intensity. So, um, and I, and I wanted to do it in a first person perspective so that when the reader got into it, my, my main character in first person is TJ, the, the captain infantry guy, that's the salt helicopter pilot with, uh, the Eagle company. And I wanted the reader hopefully early on to identify with him. And then some point they become TJ and they just live his experiences and go through it. And when they get to the end of the book, they just set it down and go, oh, my goodness, I had no idea. Of course, if you were there, you could relate to some and maybe not all of it, if not all of it. But if you weren't, and I kind of wrote this more for the general public, yeah. and I wanted to give them uh, a feel for this. There are a lot of great books out there written by other aviators about you know their experiences and so on. Uh, and there's probably a couple out there that are uh, written on a fictional basis, but I wanted to do that with this one and uh, let the reader, you know, f- hopefully feel feel for TJ. And, and when they get done, say, oh, my gosh, I just came back from a tour as a pilot in Vietnam. <laughs> yeah, we, we need to take a break. And when we come back, we're going to talk more with uh, Larry Freeman about his book, Chariots in the Sky, and um, which allows you to live vicariously through reading it, what many, many pilots went through in Vietnam. So we're going to be right back after this. You're listening to Veterans Radio. The Medal of Honor is the highest award for valor in combat given a member of the Armed Forces of the United States. There have been over 3,400 recipients of the nation's highest award. This is one of them. Army Captain Ed Freeman flew 14 rescue missions under intense enemy fire, saving 30 seriously wounded soldiers. Details after this. If you have a VA claim denied by the Board of Veterans' Appeals, contact Legal Help for Veterans at 1-800-693-4800. They're experts in handling cases before the U.S. Court of Appeals for Veterans' Claims. Their number again, 1-800-693-4800. As a flight leader, Freeman supported a heavily engaged American infantry battalion in the I Trang Valley in the Republic of Vietnam. The unit was almost out of ammunition after taking some of the heaviest casualties of the war, fighting off a relentless attack from a highly motivated, heavily armed enemy force. When the infantry commander closed the helicopter landing zone due to intense direct enemy fire, Freeman risked his own life by flying his unarmed helicopter through a gauntlet of enemy fire time after time, delivering critically needed ammunition, water, and medical supplies to the besieged battalion. His flights had a direct impact on the battle's outcome by providing the engaged units with timely supplies of ammunition critical to their survival. After medical evacuation helicopters refused to fly into the area due to intense enemy fire, Captain Freeman flew 14 separate rescue missions, providing life-saving evacuation of an estimated 30 seriously wounded soldiers, some of whom would not have survived had he not acted. All flights were made into a small emergency landing zone within 100 to 200 yards of the defensive perimeter where heavily committed units were perilously holding off the attacking elements. The Medal of Honor series is a production of Veterans Radio. Military veterans touch everyone's life. I'm guessing right now you're thinking of a veteran, a close friend, relative, 
maybe it's you. Even the toughest of us sometimes need help, but don't know where to turn for support. You don't need special training to help a veteran in your life. We can all help someone going through a difficult time. Learn how you can be there for veterans. Visit VeteransCrisisLine.net. VeteransCrisisLine.net. A message from the U.S. Department of Veterans Affairs. And we're back here on Veterans Radio, and uh, we're talking with Larry Friedman, who is the author of Chariots in the Sky, a story about U.S. helicopter pilots at war in Vietnam. And I was uh, just looking at some statistics that I got from the website from the Vietnam Veterans. Uh, actually, it's it's called the Vet- Vietnam Helicopter Pilots Association is where I grabbed these numbers from. And it, 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 it talked mostly about Hueys and, and so forth, but... Um, it talked about the number of pilots and crews that were, were killed in Vietnam. And it was, it comes out to, uh, we got 4,000, almost, almost 5,000 pilots and crewmen were killed, um, in Vietnam, which is a pretty high number considering the percentage of, of soldiers and so forth that were in Vietnam. Um, you know, if we took that 5,000 and put it up on the wall in, you know, in Washington, that's 58,000 there. That's almost 10%. Yeah, it's a pretty high number. Pretty it is high number. a pretty high number. I never realized that. I've, well, I was really lucky, that's all I can say. Then it's a good thing to know that I could make myself so small. And, you yeah. know, I didn't know I could do that. Yeah. But So you, you took this story. I, actually, it sounds like, and, and we talked about this briefly beforehand, that you lived and you, you kind of made a, a book out of it by coming up with these, these other characters uh, that, that – that, We've all run into in, in the military, whether you were a pilot or you were a private, you ran, you always Absolutely. ran into a bunch of characters. Yeah, we did. We did. Um, in my story, uh, the biggest nemesis, uh, everybody reads the book, comes back and says, I knew a person like that. Uh, and uh, a couple other characters, you always got those kind of folks in, in a unit. So, yeah, I tried to I tried to make it as real as possible without you know using any one person. So I just uh, kept them fictional and, and and ran with it, so to speak. Right. Well, that that's good because you know if if your if your company commander uh, was anything like the company commander in the book, um, none of us would have survived. <laughs> well, my character goes through three of them, and uh, the first one, of course, you got to read the book, but he epitomized to me a combat leader. Mm-hmm. And uh, the last one does too. Uh, the middle one, probably not so much. <laughs> not, not so much. And then, and they rotated. Um, just reminded me because I went through three. <laughs> sounds bad. I went through three COs myself, but they rotated every six months. Yes, yes. they had to get their command time because these are the, you know, the career officers. In right. Most yeah, my, our company commanders were, were majors. For the Chinook companies, I, I, I don't. I guess Huey companies were majors and sometimes captains, or maybe both. Uh, but we had a major, and the XO would be a captain, the operations would be a captain, and so on and so forth. Uh, I want to touch for a moment. A lot of times, people have read the book say, "Well, Larry, how did you write? Why did you write this as a Huey assault company and not a Chinook company, which which I flew?" And uh, I wanted the the, the Huey assault. Uh, pilots and crews, they, they risked their lives, as all pilots did regularly, but they were closer to the action on any given mission. They got down there a lot. And, of course, in Laos, they, they were the lifeblood for the soldiers, the South Vietnamese soldiers in Laos. Now, as Shook pilots, we, we flew the big boys, but we saw our Sarah action. When we would go into Laos, we'd go in at altitude, about six, 7,000 feet, and we only carried sling loads, stuff that hung underneath the helicopter. We couldn't carry troops into hot LZs. It'd be too many men lost if we went down. So we'd go in, and when we got over, we'd fly to our fire base and trail formation with a good distance between each Chinook, usually anywhere from four to eight of us, and uh, could be three, but usually four to eight. Um, we get out there, and our lead would get get over the fire base, and we'd be, again, like I say, maybe five, six. But by then, we'd come down a little bit. We'd still be well above the firing that was going on. Except for if they had 40 millimeters, that stuff we could get up there and you'd see this puffy black stuff flying around you. And then uh, as we got, as 
we got there, he would start down, he'd spiral. He'd turn that snook nose down. We'd be about a 30 degree dive and we'd literally just spiral right down uh, towards the fire base. And the closer we got, we started getting hit and shot uh, pretty directly when we would cross a thousand feet AGL. That's when they were pre- got pretty accurate with their machine guns. And, and if they had 20 million, 40 million, very accurate with that stuff. So once we got down around 1,500,000 feet, we would really get into the, the heavy stuff. But as we got close to the fire base, the trick was as you got low enough down, you had to uh, pull back significantly to slow your helicopter down. And in a Chinook, it's called a thrust rod instead of a collective, and you pull it up. Of course, you're pulling the cyclic back, and you're, you're, you're falling out of the sky at 1,500 feet a minute plus. And when you start jerking back on your controls to slow down, that whole Chinook just shakes itself. You, you feel like it's going to shake apart. And you, you literally get it, trying to get it back under control, and you, you eventually do. And on a very short final, you just bring it in there, and you just pop off your loads, and you take off. But down at that level, we were real big targets because we're a lot bigger than the Huey. And it was rare that you didn't get out of there without having bullet holes and shrapnel all over your Chinooks, or at least some of it some more than others because you got down there and there was mortar rounds going off in the, by the, by the third week, every fire base by the third week on was under mortar and artillery attack. So we, we get into that same stuff, but we could get back out quick if we weren't all shot up. So we didn't have to, to be in there as long as the Huey pilots did. But we, when we went in, we saw our share, just what they put up with, but I chose to ride it from a Huey standpoint. Well, the only, <laughs> We were closer to the ground, I guess you could say. Not as close as the guys on the ground, True. thankfully. But um, I, was there any additional protection on a, on a Chinook versus a Huey? I mean, I, I, you know, I always tell civilians, uh, you know, guests that are we have a, a static display of a Huey. And I said, just go up and you know, poke your finger on it, and and you'll know how thick it is. And it's you know, it's like heavy duty aluminum foil. <laughs> That's about well, it. I don't think we did. You know, we had the armored seat, which was the back and, and your, what you sat on. And then we had the little armor that you pulled out once you got in your seat. Mm-hmm. A lot of the guys in my company, I learned it when I got over there from some of the other fellas. I don't know if you all did this, but, of course, we wore the chicken plates, the ball, the armor on the front of our, 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 our chest. Yeah. But uh, we would take out a couple extras of those, and I'd put one or two down in my chin bubble because when we get down there close – uh, those guys, a lot of times towards the end of the 60 days, they were right in the wire. We, they just run right up and start shooting in the butt chin bubble and underneath us. And by having those, uh, uh, chicken plates down there in the chin bubble, uh, that, believe it or not, sometimes helped, uh, an AK-47 coming through that, coming through the bottom. But no, we didn't have any more than you. We, but we did do that a little bit. And, um, I have a friend who was a was a gunner and a, and a crew chief on a Chinook. And how many how many crewmen did you have on a on a Chinook? Five. We had pilot, co-pilot, two gunners, and a crew chief who would serve as a gunner in the back of the uh, Chinook when we you know when we were done with the mission, uh, if we needed it. So we called it the you know we we tended to call it the stinger in the back. But yeah, we had five men, five men. Okay. Um, tell us a little bit about some of the uh, adventures that you came up with for TJ and, and uh, part of the story is, is, the, is the losses that you go through when other crewmen are, are shot down and, and how many times you wouldn't even, you wouldn't even get to learn the new pilots names because you were, af- you were afraid you were going to get too close to them. Yeah. Uh, in the story, I tried to convey that, uh, you know, in that point in the war, uh, you know, units would, you, you went over as a replacement. You didn't go over as an entire unit. So you didn't, you hadn't trained with these guys that you were flying with and you hadn't been with them a while. So you didn't have close relationships. When it, in 70, 71, particularly, uh, pilots coming in would just go into a company that needed pilots and it'd take you a while. You know, you were the new guy and it took you a while to get to know other people and them know you and kind of earn your, earn your stripes and everything. But you kind of learned that, you know, uh, some guys could handle it better than others, but you didn't want to get too close, particularly if you were you were flying a lot and I mean you were losing a lot of men. Uh, Sixty days doesn't seem like a long time, but it's a lifetime in a war zone, and uh, you know guys were guys were getting killed, and uh, you, you get new guys in, and uh, they were putting them right out on the line. When we get new guys in in that operation, we didn't have any time to train them. We just 
put them in the cockpit with you and say, okay, here we go. And, uh, and uh, then uh, they didn't have a lot of time to learn what was going on. And, and that's true through the whole war, of course, not just our unit in this particular operation, but uh, uh, the newer fellows just had to uh, learn and then um, go from there. But you didn't want to get too close to, I didn't, and a lot of other guys didn't either want to get too close to other fellows. If you've been there a while and you were losing a lot of fellows, it was just tough. Were, and then, in my book, I tried to convey that because I won't give it away, but of course, uh, you know, TJ well, you, made that group. Well, you, you lose a few. Um, yeah. You have to read the book to find out who, who gets lost and who <laughs> survives. Uh, but it, it's, I, I found it such an interesting read from the standpoint that you were able to uh, put in all of the emotion that so many people would go through. And uh, that's what I meant about reading it from my experiences that I started, you know, I, I started having my own little flashbacks to different episodes um, of my tour and, and my R and R and then how important that was. Uh, the, uh, the recordings that were sent back and forth between, you know, uh, husbands and wives and letters and how important those things were and, 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 and just surviving and, right. and just getting, you know, just getting through it. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Uh, because it's, it seemed like, you know, as, and I, I don't have the statistics in, statistics in front of me, but, you know, uh, compared to World War II, the, the American soldier in, in Vietnam, the Marines and so forth, you know, were, were exposed to combat much more often because of one of the reasons was because of the helicopters, because we could take them in and, you know, just put them anywhere. And, you know, they didn't have to walk in or hike in. And, um, oh man, it's, it's an emotional read. I, I, trust me, folks. And I, and I encourage everybody out there to get a hold of this book. Where can we, where can we get one? Well, there's uh, several places. Uh, you can go to my website, LarryFreeland.com. And on there, you can go, uh, you can read a little bit about the book. You can see the reviews I've been posting. I've gotten quite a few reviews uh, from individuals and organizations. that are, uh, very, I'm very, very proud of them. But from there, you can go to buy a book, and there's five sites. There's uh, uh, Amazon, which is uh, most everybody goes to, very, and it's on uh, Barnes & Noble, and it's on, uh, oh, gosh, there's two other, three others here. Let me pull those up. Uh, Kaboo, Bam, Books a Million, and another one called IndieBound. So you can go to my site and and, and hit any one of those and order. I don't get an, an extra nickel out of going to my site. It's just easier for a person. Or you can go direct to your account if you're with Barnes or you're with uh, uh, Amazon. And then you can also go to your local bookstore. I've got a couple of local bookstores here carrying it, but you can go to any if you're you know if you have your local bookstore that you like, you can go there and they can order it for you. Right, so, and, and uh, this isn't your. This isn't the uh, last book in your writing career, is it? Tell me about some other things that you've got going. We've got a couple of minutes here. Okay, uh, I'm currently. I proposed a trilogy. I wrote up a summary for writing a trilogy, uh, and I had that in my uh, on my mind for a while, and proposed it to my publisher, and he thought it was a good idea, and said, "Write your first first book." So I've been working on that since uh march and i just this past week finished the last chapter so i've got the first draft of my manuscript from book one of my trilogy and uh, now i've got to go through that's the topic of that trilogy what's the topic uh it's it's a trilogy about a family it's an american family of three generations of men that start with the patriarch who serves in world war one as a doughboy and the first book's dedicated to him and, the, and it's going to be historical fiction. Uh, and then the second book, he's going to have a son. And the second book is going to be about his son. He's going to be a career military man and be in World War II, Korea, Cold War, Cuban Missile Crisis, and start of Vietnam. And he's going to have three sons who are going to go into the third book. Third book and they'll all serve Vietnam War through our current wars. Okay. And, That's not there. I'm like just anxious to uh, keep me on your mailing list. I'd be happy to read those and help you out. I want to thank uh, Larry Freeland very much for being on Veterans Radio today. The book is Chariots in the Sky, a story about U.S. assault helicopter pilots at war in Vietnam. Um, it, it's, it's, it's such a great group of guys that we got to know during that time period and to be part of that organization uh, 
it was such an honor. I, you know, I didn't even realize it at the time, of course, but as I look back on it, we did a lot of good things. We did. We did. So thank you very much. Mary. Well, thank you. I appreciate you having me on Dale. Okay. We'll have you on again soon. I hope. Okay. Thank you. <laughs> All right. We're coming up to the end of another veterans radio program. I want to encourage you to go to our website to watch or listen to some of our other programs. Also, that next week is our benefits program, and I want to make sure that you send your questions in if you have any questions for our experts on either uh, veterans health care or the disability side of it and some of the benefits that you may be entitled to. I want to make sure that I do thank all of our sponsors again one more time, and that is uh, Legal Help for Veterans. It is always a pleasure to talk to you. It's always an honor for me to tell the stories of these American men and women who are putting everything on the line just for you. So tune in the American Veteran on PBS on Tuesday night at 9 o'clock. And until next week, this is Dale Throneberry, and I will see you then. You are dismissed. Judy was boring. Hello. Then Judy discovered Jumbacasino.com. It's my little escape. Now Judy's the life of the party. Oh, baby, mama's bringing home the bacon. Whoa, take it easy, Judy. <laughs> The Chumba Life is for everybody. So go to ChumbaCasino.com and play over 100 casino-style games. Join today and play for free for your chance to redeem some serious prizes. ChumbaCasino.com. No purchase necessary. Voidware prohibited by law. 18 plus terms and conditions apply. See website for details.